The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, this is Elisa Baum. I'm Grid Gain Systems Director of Product Marketing. I'll begin in just a moment, but first I need to conduct a bit of housekeeping. Could you please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me? And let's see, I see hands, thank you. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute, but should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible. In addition, I'll make sure that everyone receives a link to both the recording and the slides within 48 hours after the presentation ends. Uh, now a brief introduction to today's speaker, today's webinar is comparing Apache Ignite and Cassandra for Hybrid Transactional Analytical Processing, or HTAP. It's being presented by Dennis Magda. He is GridGain Systems Director of Product Management, and he's also our Apache Ignite PMC Chair. Um, the questions section will be headed up by Rob Meyer, and he's GridGain Systems Senior Director of Outbound Product Management. And for those of you not familiar with GridGain Systems, we are the company that originally contributed the code to the Apache Ignite project and are the leading contributor of the project today. And we also provide the only commercially supported release of Ignite along with security, deployment, monitoring management, and support and services. So with that said, I will turn the floor over to Dennis. Go ahead, Dennis. Hello, Alip. Hello, Alisa. Hello, Rob. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this presentation. And as Alisa said, we are going to discover and to look at an interesting topic. So we are going to compare Apache Ignite and Apache Cassandra, both projects that belong to Apache Software Foundation, and see, are they applicable for HTAP applications, which stands for Hybrid Transactional and Analytical Processing. We all we know that actually Ignite and Cassandra initially probably were designed for some specific use cases, but now the market evolves the demands are being changed. And this is why we see a new term that appeared uh, within the mass media, and uh, which is HTAP. And the goal of today's presentation is to outline what does HTAP means, mean, what are its, uh, what are its requirements, and how does uh, Ignite uh, satisfy HTAP requirements, and what's about Cassandra? Are they comparable? If they're comparable for those use cases, then what can you expect from both databases, from both uh, projects? So let's move on and see at our uh, agenda for today. First, I just will spend a couple of minutes uh, covering hybrid transactional analytical processing. My goal is just to give you a brief understanding so that we are uh, stay on the same line. So we understand the main terms and uh, the demands and uh, interesting points about that uh, growing uh, processing thing. Next, we are going to compare or going forward and compare Ignite and Cassandra, specifically uh, leaning on the hybrid transaction and analytical processing. For instance, we are going to look how they, how Ignite and Cassandra architecture compares. What happens if you decide to uh, build your applications uh, depending on the normalized architecture of Cassandra? Or what will you get if you design your systems based on the affinity allocations and allocated processing of Ignite? Going forward, if you uh, take a look at the hybrid transactional analytical processing term, you'll see the transactional part presents there. So it means that those applications of, the, of that market require some transactional guarantees. And actually, Cassandra, both Cassandra and Ignite has, uh, have something to know for you there. And they are going to compare the benefits, the transactional benefits and features that are uh, available in both storages. And final thing, uh, hybrid uh, HTAP applications. When, when I hear about HTAP applications, uh, the conversations and the use cases are always related, or at least in 90% of scenarios, they're related to in-memory computing. Because if you really want to uh, get benefits of HTAP applications, you need to consider uh, in-memory calculations, in-memory processing. And this is why we are going to compare and look at caching of Cassandra versus in-memory store of Ignite. Uh, what you get with any of this option and what can you expect if you decide to go for this Ignite and Cassandra. And in that third part, we're also going to uh, 
uh, look at Cassandra and Ignite benchmarks that compare uh, the speed of free depurations, write depurations, and uh, different mixed workloads. So then, uh, this is why I, I would encourage you to stay on the line and to see how the performance is compared of these two databases. And finally, eventually, we'll have some time for your quest questions and answers. Okay, let's move on and look at the hybrid transaction analytical processing. Here is actually, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I just want to uh, borrow the term how it's defined by Gartner, the analytical company that actually made up this term and uh, now driving it further within the market of distributed systems and distributed application. As the Gartner says, HTAP is an emerging application architecture that breaks the wall between transactions processing and analytics. It enables more informed and in business real-time decision-making. So the main conclusion I would draw from this term is that HTAP applications uh, have to deal with both operational and analytical workloads. Uh, if, uh, because historically, uh, operational and analytical workloads are divided. They are served by different technologies and by different vendors. The goal of HTAP is to try to combine these scenarios uh, by relying on a single system. And this is actually what HTAP enabled applications can suppose to get from HTAP enabled platforms. So those platforms should be able and must support processing of both transactional and analytical workloads. It will depend on use case. Some of the platforms will be uh, will better serve transactional workloads, while the others analytical workloads. But the general uh, rule here is that you need to find a golden uh, middle uh, that will satisfy your use case so that you don't need to do ETL from one system to another, uh, but rather you would like to run both uh, operational and, and analytical workloads in a single system in such a way that it meets your expectation, meets your demands. And the other part that is uh, that also stands, uh, stands out in this definition is real-time, business real-time decision-making. HTAP, as I said, uh, highly relies on uh, fast computing, in memory uh, calculation, in memory processing. And this is uh, what's driven by many real-time processing engine nowadays. Real-time implied that every query, let it be a transaction or analytical query, uh, needs to be completed as fast as possible, preferably in real-time. And you define what the real-time means for your specific use case depending on your SLAs. But the whole goal here is that when we talk about the real time, we expect that the data our HTAP applications deal with is going to be changed frequently. And we need to process it efficiently. So that's, uh, if to put it simply, HTAP is a new hybrid transactional and analytical processing paradigm uh, that empowers uh, current modern applications with new technologies and solutions that make it possible to uh, support both analytical and transactional workloads in real time. So now let's see how Ignite and Cassandra are related to HDAP, what they can give to HDAP world for this new emerging uh, market segment. So first I would start with comparing Ignite with Cassandra by looking at their architecture. Specifically, we are going to compare how Cassandra, so-called denormalized or query-driven architecture, compares to Ignite's affinity-based architecture. What are the benefits and what are the disadvantages of both? So Cassandra path is pretty straightforward. Uh, many of us, we knew Cassandra and we uh, accustomed to using it in many applications and the idea with the architecture in Cassandra is pretty simple. You need to denormalize your data. Denormalization uh, is a strategy used in previously normalized database to increase performance. The idea behind it is to add redundant data where we think it will help us the most. We can use extra attributes in existing table or we can even add new tables or so that we can satisfy and run as many queries as we want, paying by uh, data redundancy. So the overall benefit of this denormalized architecture uh, that made Cassandra so popular database uh, of our times is the performance. And the performance, you gain the performance uh, by sacrificing data redundancy. I mean that you have to store 
an extra copy of your data if you want to run specific uh, queries in an optimal way in Cassandra. And we are going, going forward, we are going to review a simple uh, scenario uh, when assuming that we get some query and we want to design Cassandra application for, for this query. And then we'll see how this, uh, how the data redundancy uh, problem can arise over the time with Cassandra. As for the uh, disadvantages here is, uh, it's actually it's arguable. Some of the people might say that qu the query driven architecture is not that bad and actually it's a, a central part of the overall Cassandra architecture and they will be true. But at the same time, I will uh, counterpart here saying that uh, query driven architecture is really good enough uh, if your project is not evolving significantly over the time. Because uh, undoubtedly, it's uh, sometimes it's pretty easy to start with Cassandra because you're just putting together a list of queries you'd like to run. You create tables, you uh, uh, store data there, but all the time, if you need to evolve, if you need to change your architecture, if you need to come up with new queries, uh, you, uh, your main data maintenance step might turn into a nightmare. And so now let's take a look at a simple example so that I can just uh, show you an, an example on, on, on what I'm talking about. Let's take this simple database. It's a classic database that represents all the cars uh, that were developed by special vendors and every car or a specific vendor is being produced in some location. And so this, uh, like uh, here is we see this relational uh, architecture. The cars belong to, are related to a specific vendor. And as for the production, uh, here is we also have relations between production and cars and vendors. So that it's pretty easy. In Cassandra, actually, we also can go ahead and create the same table. But it wouldn't have any sense. Because if you do it this way, like you would do in the relational databases, then your queries might be not optimal in Cassandra. Because as Cassandra uh, architecture suggests first, you need to come up with a list of queries you'd like to use in your application. And only after that, start modeling your data, start denormalizing your data, start preparing the tables or attributes you need. And here is let's uh, now try to follow this approach. Let's uh, assume that we have uh, this query that our application needs to answer. So the query is pretty simple. What are the car models produced by a vendor within a particular time frame? And we want to show the newest cars first. That we are. Uh, and here is what we need to have. We want to store information about car, vendor that produced uh, the car, and when the car was produced. Pretty simple, right? And here is what we are doing. We're creating a simple table with Cassandra. And this table, We'll store vendor name, production year, car model, and the total number of cars produced by this vendor uh, in specific year. A primary key, then we need to follow some rules. Uh, Cassandra architecture uh, is requires us to def define a primary key in such a way so that vendor name will be our uh, vendor name will identify a node that owns this record. So the vendor name will be used by Cassandra clients to send the request to the node that owns a partition or a data or shard that stores this record. And then inside of that shard or partition, uh, we are going to spread out the data uh, using clustering columns such as production year and car model. So that will be our complex compound primary key. And then with the clustering order by statement, we are saying that all the uh, columns uh, in Cassandra will be ordered by production year first and then by the car model. So that's our simple table. It's easy, right? And it's actually, uh, it's the beauty and at the same time, the ugliness of Cassandra. Why the ugliness? I'll explain you later. But the beauty is pretty simple. Now we have the table and now we can run that query. SQL query, Cassandra query, that answers our first question. So we just are going to select all the cars, production years, and total number produced by uh, this vendor, uh, uh, starting uh, in 2017 and, uh, and later years. So also what we can do in advance, 
we also can run some extra queries out of the box. So we don't need to design or change our data model. So we can reuse the same table, the same data, for instance, to select all the cards produced by this uh, by a specific vendor. It's easy to do in Cassandra because vendor name is your uh, partition key or your shard key, and this operation will be executed quick, uh, pretty fast. Uh, the Cassandra will just find out node that owns Ford Motors records. I will send your query there, and that node will return you all the columns that represent the data, uh, all the cards that were developed, uh, produced by that vendor. But uh, pretty easy, right? And pretty straightforward. But what happens next? Assume that now our application is up and running and we, it's already in production. But then uh, uh, a manager comes to our desks and requires to do some changes to our application. Specifically, he just comes and asks, you know, now I need to uh, to see the to see result for the following question in my re report that I sent to the top level management. And the question is pretty simple. The question, the second question uh, asks, what are the number of cars of a specific model produced by a vendor? It's pretty easy, right? And you like as a developer sitting and uh, guessing that, oh, I can just easily do this uh, query in a minute because second, actually I have all the data and all the data is stored in the table that I created before. So, and I just, as a developer, I created this new query and this query, I'm just using the same, I'm just uh, accepting some vendor name and car model. And I would like to return uh, a number of cars produced by a vendor uh, per specific year. But something goes wrong. And after I run this query, I see this exception that is uh, thrown by Cassandra. The exception simply uh, states that you cannot get the data without specifying a time frame, without setting a year you would like to get the information for. Why so that? It's because in our in our table that was designed for the question one, we have a production year as a part of our primary key. And the production year goes before car model field, which requires us to specify the year first. Otherwise, you will get an exception. Or if you want to avoid this exception, you have two options. As far as I remember, uh, you can so uh, skip this exception, ignore this exception somehow by dif doing different tunings. But in that case, Cassandra will do a full scan over your data, which is not the best option. Or as, as Cassandra suggests, we need to create a different table or we need to uh, do some changes with the existing one. Actually, I don't see how I can change the existing one table because otherwise uh, I won't be able to execute my first query. And this is why I decided to create a new table for my second query. So this is how my second table will look like. So again, here is a vendor name, car model, production year, total number of cars produced. And my primary key will be vendor name, car model, and production year. The, counter, the primary key, this compound primary key, defines a unique record inside of Cassandra and also defines uh, the sequence of uh, how you can retrieve, how you must retrieve the data. First, you need to specify vendor name all the times, and then you have to specify car model. You cannot specify production year before car model, right? That's uh, how Cassandra works. And let's now compare this table with the table to the table created for the first query. Try to find the differences. So actually, if you take a look at the fields definition, you will find that we store completely the same data. We store vendor name, production year, car model, and total number of cars produced. The only difference is in the primary key, and not just uh, in the number of fields of the primary key, but in the way how we, uh, in the sequence of the primary, in the sequence of the fields inside of our primary key. In the first table, first we want to get production year. We are requesting car models produced within a specific uh, year. While in the first query, we don't, we are not interested in the year. You just want to get all the cars uh, for the specific vendor name. And that's actually, uh, I would say, a bad thing uh, about the query-driven architecture or the normalized architecture. Because now there will be scenarios when you are already in production and you need to, uh, 
uh, update your the new demands are coming for your application you need to update it and there will be scenarios you will hit them sooner or later when you are going to create extra tables that will store uh, redundant copies of the same data and this is how your overall disk consumption can grow yes many uh, cassandra users existing users can say that oh we are fine to pay this price and they might be correct but for the hybrid transaction and analytical processing application it becomes uh, a little bit inconvenient thing because first too much data is going to be uh, duplicated a lot across the cluster of machines and next you need to keep this data in sync somehow because if you're updating a vendor name you need to update the vendor name uh, atomically in all the tables you have and you need to come up with other scenarios okay now let's see how ignite handles uh, uh this situation what ignite ignites architecture gives us actually ignite architecture is based on so-called affinity collocation so usually no sql vendors uh when they talk about sql joins they say that sql joins are expensive and they're expensive especially in in uh, distributed architectures and this is why this is how they explain their query driven or denormalized approaches they take uh, and support in their systems but nowadays many uh, new sql databases or many distributed databases prove that it's no longer correct take a look at google spanner take a look at cockroach db take a look at uh, ignite or grid gain all those distributed databases prove that uh, SQL joins can be really cheap and they be, can be really efficient if you architect your uh, if you architect your applications in the right way. And to do this in the right way, we are using affinity collocation. So let's uh, figure out what affinity collocation means. So to put it simply, affinity collocation is all about uh, related data. It's, it's about uh, storing related data on a single cluster node. For instance, countries and cities are related. How are they related? City is located in some country. And uh, this is why if you decide to store all the cities uh, on the same node where a country record is located, this is how you achieve uh, the affinity collocation. And the same is true for vendors and cars. We can easily uh, implement our architecture in such a way that all the cars that are produced by a specific vendor will be located on a single node. And then if we uh, follow this approach, if we benefit from this approach, we can leverage from the collocated processing concepts. But the collocated processing is based on the affinity collocation of your data. So for instance, what are the benefits? First, efficient and fast SQL joints, distributed SQL joints. Here is we can talk not only about Ignite, but here is I also can uh, put Google Spanner, CockroachDB, or MimeSQL as an example. Those databases also give you all the uh, hooks and parameters needed to set up affinity collocation between your data. And after that, you can run efficient SQL joints. I will show you a little bit later how uh, a distributed collocated SQL join works uh, in that scenario. Uh, moreover, it's not only about the SQL joins. Products such as uh, Ignite can support uh, collocated computations. We all we know about MapReduce framework, right? Uh, which is usually related to Hadoop world, to big data world. But also the MapReduce uh, approaches and techniques are supported in the fast data world. It's supported for edge type applications and it's supported by Ignite. So the whole idea here is that you create your calculation and uh, instead of getting data from your cluster nodes and processing the data uh, on your application site, your application can send this calculation, several bytes or kilobytes of data to your cluster nodes and do all the calculation in place on the server side without any data movement over the network and also now we see uh, a rise of uh, machine learning deep learning uh, 
for different purposes, such as uh, fraud detection, predictive analytics, uh, customer experience, et cetera, et cetera. And those machine learning algorithms, they are always, they are already go beyond capacity of a single machines. They want, they also want to be run and executed in real time or in near real time, not in offline, not over our analytical database. And machine learning without uh, ETL can be done by basing on the calculated processing. If machine learning data sets are calculated and stored in the right way across the cluster of machines, you can easily do fraud detection or predictive analytics really fast, complying with the strictest SLAs of our days. And the overall idea of the affinity calculation and calculated processing is that you are gaining uh, much better performance by reducing network traffic between your applications and between your server nodes. Because if you could allocate the data in the right way, then SQL transactions, uh, MapReduce calculations or machine learning uh, algorithms can be executed much more efficiently or the data that is stored locally on your cluster machines. And now let's take a look how it uh, technically looks like for our example we are discussing right now. We have, uh, just to remind you, we have that uh, data model of vendors, cars, and production. And now uh, by setting up the affinity allocation between our uh, vendors and cars, we can get this data distribution you see on the slide. So for instance, what you got, all the cars produced by, let's say, Toyota in a specific region will be stored on the first Ignite node, while the cars produced by Ford Motors will be stored on the second node. And the same will be, will be done for the rest of the cars uh, you have in your database. And immediately, as an advantage of this approach. We can create our tables in Ignite using affinity allocation. Uh, the data will be distributed automatically as soon as we start adding it to the cluster. But then in return, we can run all the queries we like. We don't need to develop uh, or create a table for a specific query. We can work with our tables as we would work uh, with a relational database. As we know, in the relational database scenario, we just define the tables, we define relations with them, and then if we need, we can run any query. If we want to boost a query, then most likely we would we need to define an index. And with Ignite, uh, or with Ignite, or Google Spanner, or MemSQL, uh, the idea is the same. First, you need to define the relations between your tables using affinity allocation approach. The data after that the data will be distributed and then you can run any query like this one. This query actually answers on the first question uh, our application has to do. How many uh, cars are produced by a specific vendor within a specific time frame? And here is we are just joining the data stored in different tables. And when this join occurs, uh, the query will be sent from our application to all the cluster nodes that store the data. And the join and the query will happen in place on the server side. As you see here, there is no any data movement between your between node one, node two, or other nodes. Once the query is completed, uh, result set will be sent back to our application, and application will do the final merge locally, getting back the final result set uh, to our code. So that's how it is easy. So this is actually how the are allocated joins, how the distributed joins are uh, supported and used nowadays by, uh, provided nowadays by uh, modern distributed databases. And in advance, it's not only the allocated processing and affinity allocation is not only about uh, SQL queries, as I said. Also, if you know that the data like here is, uh, is stored efficiently across the cluster, then you can run more advanced calculations. You can run your custom code close to the data, or you can run machine learning code close to the data. For instance, on this slide, we uh, I'm just talking about uh, the applicability of uh, a set of genetic algorithms that are available in Ignite. So actually, genetic algorithms is a method of solving optimization problems by simulating the process of biological evolution. 
real-world applications of genetic algorithms include automotive design, computer gaming, robotics investments, traffic treatment, etc., etc. And the idea here is that uh, you just store chromosomes and genes uh, across a cluster of machine in the collocated way, and then when you are doing the emulation of your uh, biological uh, evolution, when you are defining or creating a new population that represents your result uh, for your task, you're going to run specific calculations on a specific cluster node. And Ignite provides special APIs that are used here. So the overall, as a summary uh, of this uh, architectural block is that with Ignite, with, with Cassandra, you can achieve a fast performance by switching to the denormalized architecture approach. I also call it query-driven approach. Uh, as the practice shows, it's pretty easy to start with it, uh, but over the time when your application evolves, it can become a nightmare because the new queries will uh, be required to support. And you, you sometimes and usually you need to create new tables uh, generating more and more data copies of the cluster. And you're going to, at some point of time, you're uh, most likely you're going to store a lot of redundant data in your cluster. That might not work for edge tab application for sure, because edge tab applications want to use data efficiently on disk and the memory. And here is by the efficiency uh, in this century, we many databases already uh, proposed to use the affinity collocation based approach when the related data is collocated over the cluster of machines, uh, which allows you to run efficient SQL queries, computations, transactions, uh, emitting any, sense, uh, any significant data movement over the network. Next. Now let's take a look at the second part. Now let's take a look at transactional part of our HTAP applications. Because with, in the HTAP world, we need to process or support some of the transactional workloads, some of the transactional applications. And here is we are going to compare role, role level isolation of Cassandra and uh, true distributed transactions to Ignite. So Cassandra, if you Google for Cassandra transactions, actually you will see lightweight transactions terms uh, term pop up in your Google search. Uh, technically, uh, if to speak about Cassandra uh, transactional capabilities, uh, first Cassandra is an eventually consistent database, and there is nothing wrong with this. It was designed for uh, these scenarios, and it might work even for some edge tap applications because. For the transactions, Cassandra offers so-called row level isolation. But my, in my personal opinion, I would not call, I wouldn't consider row level isolation or row level atomic updates as transaction. It's just an ability to update a single row atomically without any intervention. Intervention. For me, when I think about transactions, I at least imagine, you know, update uh, an update of two separated records that potentially are stored on different cluster machines. Cassandra doesn't support this. What Cassandra supports is an ability to update a single record atomically, confirming that no one else will be able to update it in parallel. And actually the applicability is pretty simple of this scenario. Uh, here is we can support atomic or linearizable updates of a specific record whenever you need it. If, for instance, you need to change the field of your user account or do anything else with a specific record, you can do it with Cassandra. Or like if you create a new user account and there is a possibility that the same account can be created in parallel from two applications, you can prevent, you can avoid this uh, and the duplicated accounts created on inserts by using this feature. Uh, again, so in my opinion, this a role level isolation might be enough for some of the HTAP applications because HTAP market is really broad as we see. Uh, but I'm really concerned that uh, this uh, lightweight transactional approach uh, will help to adopt Cassandra widely for the HTAP world. Why so that? Because sometimes when, as I said, when I hear transactions, I usually consider that at least two rows 
that are stored on two different cluster machines can be updated within a transaction. Cassandra doesn't support this. I just for the Ignite, it allows us to achieve uh, uh, that behavior. So if to talk about Ignite transactions, what do we get with them? Those are just uh, uh, standard distributed asset transactions that would remind you transactions of relational databases. You can run pessimistic or optimistic transactions. Ignite provides a variety of different isolation levels and concurrency modes, such as repeatable read, read committed, uh, or serializable. It's up to you. Moreover, if you'd like to, we know that a transaction, when we run a transaction, uh, there can be a situation that an application comes to a deadlock. If two transactions, uh, we're trying to acquire logs for different keys in the reverse order. In Ignite, actually, we have different deadlock prevention uh, mechanics. For instance, you can run deadlock free transactions if you use serializable optimistic transactions. Or you can uh, uh, troubleshoot and avoid transaction by uh, using our deadlock detection mechanism. Or finally, you also can define special timeouts and that will fire if a transaction is in that deadlock and hands for a while so that Ignite can unfreeze your applications. How do we support the transactional? Uh, how do we provide, how Ignite provides transactional guarantors? It's pretty simple. We support to phase commit protocol. And then we talk about transactions in Ignite. We talk about the consistency and at both memory layer and disk layer. When it comes to disk, if you use Ignite native persistence, then all the changes will be written to the right the headlock file in specific partition files. When it comes to a third party persistence uh, that uh, might be used altogether with Ignite, here is if, uh, if a persistence is transactional, such as a relational database, then a transaction will be uh, committed to both your relational database in Ignite and it will stay consistent. And finally, when we talk about applicability, there are no any limitations. Seriously, no limitations for Ignite transactions. Ignite uh, transactions can be used for every scenario you'd like. And this is probably why Ignite is widely adopted in different uh, financial systems that use it to do money transfers, to do payments, to deal with uh, our money, with our bank accounts. Why so that? Because they trust and see transactions uh, that are supported by Ignite. And if to go back to the HTAP applications, HTAP applications usually sometimes, even when we start design our application, and we consider that, oh yeah, usually it might be enough to use role level isolation of Cassandra, but over the time it usually will happen when the manager, manager comes to our cubicle and asks, you know, to uh, do something more advanced, let's say to update two records that are stored on two different cluster nodes. And this is where the Cassandra can fail short and it will be too late for you. But with Ignite, it's never too late. With Ignite transactions, uh, you can update as many rows as you'd like, and those rows can be stored in different tables across different machine, machines of our cluster. And final thing, speaking, that is also required and essential for hybrid and transactional analytical processing. It's performance, it's real-time processing. And usually when we speak about the performance nowadays, uh, that question goes into the direction of in-memory computing. Because uh, technically uh, the disk-based databases uh, already got everything they could from disk technologies. It has different hardware vendors such as Intel can come up with new storage uh, technologies such as Intel 3D Crosspoint, uh, but even Intel uh, 3D Crosspoint cannot beat RAM. RAM still will be the fastest storage you can get nowadays. And HTAP applications that want to do real-time processing of the data highly rely on the caching or in-memory technologies of the products they are based on. And here is I would uh, compare caching capabilities of Ignite of Cassandra and the memory store of Ignite. So let's start with uh, Cassandra. So what are the options we have with Cassandra? First, I would remind uh, you that Cassandra is a disk-based database. 
it was designed for those scenarios. The whole purpose of Cassandra initially was to support scalability, availability, and variety intensive applications. So Cassandra storage, disk-based storage, is truly designed for variety intensive applications. It's optimized for that scenario. And it, it's disk-based storage. But over the time, uh, while the Cassandra uh, was being adopted by different applications, memory became cheap. And now users, uh, existing Cassandra users and new Cassandra users started uh, blasting different questions about the in-memory caching. And Ignite and Cassandra actually supports several options. If I would split them on off-heap options and Java heap options. As you know, Cassandra is a Java applications application. And actually you can cache data both in Java heap or outside of Java heap. The, uh, the uh, advantage of the uh, off heap approach is that you can cache as much data as you like, usually depending on the technology you use, because uh, you're not going to face uh, long garbage collection poses. But with Java heap, it's a little bit faster for Java uh, products such as Cassandra, but uh, the size of your Java heap cache is always limited due to the long uh, garbage collection process. Okay, and so now if you uh, quickly compare off heap options of Cassandra first, you can use page cache. So actually page cache is a, I would call it as a special buffer supported by operating system. So for me, a page cache is something that is provided by an operating system out of the box. In that scenario, as far as I remember, you need to, def to define memory map files or use other, uh, uh, configuration parameters of your of Cassandra and your operating system to make use of that uh, caching technology. At the same time, Cassandra provides its own uh, caching hooks. For instance, you can use raw cache, uh, which avoids uh, disk heat, uh, but enabled only for rows. And in that scenario, there will be some region in, uh, managed by Cassandra that will keep uh, most frequently access rows. And the key cache uh, that is uh, uh, that is an option uh, supported for the Java heap caching, uh, it caches uh, the keys in memory so that you don't need to go to disk if you would, uh, if you need to do a lookup of a specific cache. Also, we know that uh, data stacks in memory, data stacks, the company that provides enterprise level support and features for Cassandra, they have data stacks in memory uh, that prevents, uh, that actually can store all the data in RAM. But to my knowledge, that's a Java heap option, which means that still, if let's say you, your machine has, uh, let's say one gigab uh, gig 100 gigabytes of RAM, you won't be able to use all the RAM for the purpose of uh, Cassandra. Because uh, if, uh, as soon as you start dedicating uh, more than 20 or 30 or 40 gigabytes of RAM, for data stacks in memory, I bet you're going to hit uh, tough uh, garbage collection poses simply because the data is cached in Java heap. So, and here is uh, the outcome. Actually, Cassandra doesn't have, Cassandra uses some different in memory options, but Cassandra is not an in memory store. Yes, it can rely on capabilities of uh, an operating system such as page cache, or it can uh, provide you some uh, techniques to cache most frequently access data by using raw cache. Or you can even use uh, data stacks in memory, but all of them just, they do not allow you to store all the data, the whole quality of data you have in memory in most of the scenarios. Or if you would try, if you try to do that, most likely you will face some limitations of your uh, Java heap storage of Cassandra or other limitations imposed by an operating system. But when it comes to Ignite, uh, in Ignite is a little bit, uh, is a little bit different uh, animal. Here is in Ignite, uh, Ignite is widely used for different caching or data grid scenarios, uh, but it's not just a cache. Uh, it's a in memory storage that stores your data and indexes in a special format efficiently in RAM, directly in RAM. Moreover, you don't need to use persistence in Ignite if you, if you, don't, if you don't want uh, to have your data on disk. 
you can uh, fully use Ignite as uh, in-memory storage. And with uh, its in-memory storage, all the data is stored first. It's stored uh, in the off-heap region, uh, which allows us to consume all the RAM you have. For instance, I know one of the uh, Ignite users uh, dedicates uh, uh, dedicates machines, and when every machine uh, has up to seven gigabytes of RAM, and Ignite can consume and efficiently use all that space on a single machine without any limitations. And when it comes to disk, here is you just enable. If you talk about Ignite native persistence, you enable that persistence, and uh, after that, the whole copy of the disk will be stored the whole copy of the data and indexes will be stored on disk. In addition, you can provide different configurations. Uh, for instance, uh, if you don't want, like, uh, you're not obligated to store all the data in RAM if you, if you have a disk. It's all about your budget. It's all about your hardware. We can store 30% of data in RAM and 100% on disk. Or we can store so 100% of in RAM and 100% in disk. And there are many more configurations, it's up to you. So we can store X percent in RAM and 100% in disk. It's up to you to decide how much data you would like to cache. But when we talk about caching in this scenario, keep in mind that we are dealing with uh, in-memory storage that is optimized for, uh, for RAM. And here is just to give you a kind of a better understanding on how the caching techniques uh, uh, that are supported by and used by Cassandra users are compared to in-memory storage that is used by Ignite users. I'd like to show these uh, benchmarks uh, that we did recently. So we used uh, standard Yahoo uh, benchmarks uh, that are utilized by many distributed database uh, projects and vendors. So looking at this slide, you will see that uh, Y axis represents operations per second and the x-axis shows types of measured operations. Overall, this specific benchmark suggests that Ignite outperforms Cassandra significantly in delete workloads. Uh, for instance, uh, Ignite was uh, three, x three times faster than Cassandra and mixed work workloads, such as reads plus updates, where Ignite was two times faster. And actually it was anticipated because as we said, Ignite can keep and store all the data and indexes in RAM as much, it doesn't matter. So give us all the memory we have and we will keep all the data there. And we also tried to tune, we tried to tune uh, Cassandra. We used page cache, we used the row cache, we used key fil filters referring to the guidelines uh, of Cassandra users, but this is what we get. So that's the difference between the memory cache uh, and uh, just about basic caching techniques and in memory storage. Next, we decided to increase the workload because in that first run, we uh, uh, 32 uh, applications were accessing the uh, accessing Cassandra and Ignite cluster. And then we decided to ramp up our workload. We decided to increase it to see what happens. And now and the, uh, the second benchmark or 20 256 threads or applications, uh, the processing the data stored both in Ignite and Cassandra. And here, as we can see, that Ignite kept its lead with read intensive and mixed workloads, where now it performed six times faster on average. Just see the difference. That's only because Ignite uses in memory cache. But at the same time, uh, uh, Ignite uh, kept the lead in uh, mixed workloads. Here, as you can see, read, uh, read and update operations or insert operations. However, also Cassandra pulled the hat in update benchmarks. And actually it sounds reasonable and we expect it to reproduce it since Cassandra's columnar store is architected for, the, for those operations, for write intensive operations. Uh, while Ignite persistence that was enabled in that workload inherited most of its principles from relational databases. So in Ignite also like in this benchmark so that you understand it, it's not in Ignite, we used Ignite persistence plus it's in memory storage. In Cassandra, we used uh, Cassandra persistence plus different memory techniques, uh, optimization techniques suggested by Cassandra community and users. But we were also, what's the general outcome of this? What's a uh, general conclusion they can 
derive from these uh, uh, benchmarks. So actually, this, uh, uh, bench, uh, these benchmarks show that nothing can beat in memory storage. Just take a look at read workloads or mixed workloads, where both reads and updates are used in our applications. And actually, uh, here is, uh, most of the applications will come to the mixed workloads, right? And here, as you can see, the power of the memory computing. It's not enough just to use uh, operating system cache. You need to be able to store data in indexes efficiently. And this is what's re required for each app applications. And as soon as your load grows, your storage will grow as well. And when it comes to the persistence in memory computing products or technologies such as Signite or GridKey, they also don't sacrifice the durability. In these benchmarks, we have Ignite persistence enabled, and all the changes were written to the write ahead log file of Ignite. And also, the uh, checkpointing process were, uh, was executed in the ground. It's pretty simple techniques that are used by uh, Cassandra persistence. But so, what else Cassandra users can get then? how Cassandra users can accelerate their performance. Uh, in addition to the uh, approaches we already uh, walked through, Cassandra Ignite is also used sometimes to accelerate Cassandra. It might sound funny, but it happens. And uh, Ignite community even developed a special Cassandra application. And Cassandra is used as a third party database. And we are seeing more and more deployments that are based on Cassandra. And in those deployments, Ignite is being deployed in between your applications and your Cassandra cluster. And after that, Ignite uh, makes sure that uh, Cassandra stays, stays consistent with its, its data set. And once you have all the data in memory in Ignite, you can think of Cassandra as your backup storage that is needed only if your Ignite cluster goes down. Uh, but once you have all the data in Ignite, you can leverage from Ignite SQL queries and Ignite the seed transactions. For sure, when you will be running in Ignite AC transactions, uh, the changes will be committed to Cassandra, but they will be committed not in a transactional fashion because we cannot make Cassandra transactional. But all the changes that happen in memory, they will be transactional. So I think of it. So a final summary on this. So Ignite or Cassandra for each type application. It's up to you to decide. In general, even for each type application, if we take uh, the generalization, of Cassandra and row level isolation and the simplest caching techniques it provides, you can find different applications that uh, Cassandra will be more than enough. But personally, strategically, I don't see Cassandra as a strategic uh, platform for HTAP enabled applications uh, that usually required much more advanced uh, transactional capabilities, uh, much more advanced. Uh, APIs that are needed to do fraud detection, predictive analytics, or calculations, and to do this in real time. And if to take a look at Cassandra, I don't know how you're going to do, uh, how to going to run machine learning app or uh, algorithms or the data stored in Cassandra efficiently. But you can, for instance, do this easily with Ignite. And when it comes to performance, I know that uh, many people judge. Uh, uh, every database by, by performance. Here is, I would do a short summary. Uh, as our benchmarks confirmed, and we here is want to be fair with you guys, we, we confirmed that Cassandra uh, behaves and operates well for write intensive workloads. 100% of operations are writes. Uh, but when it comes to Ignite, and especially, but when it comes to Ignite, it's much better suited for read intensive and mixed workloads. Uh, but as for the mixed workloads, in my understanding, I've been working with many uh, companies. I've been working with uh, uh, designing and working with many applications. And in the real world, usually we are dealing with the mixed workloads. At least 90% of the applications we developed so far deal with the mixed workload. So it's up to you to decide what would be your next H tab application and what would be a backbone of your uh, next H tab service or application. So having said that, I'm ready for your questions. Great. Uh, this is Rob. Uh, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Can you hear me well, Dennis? Yeah, hi, Rob. I can hear you well. Uh, OK, perfect. So there were a few questions that came up. The first round of questions was around 
just trying to understand about HTAP and why we care. And if I could summarize what was going on in the background, um, HTAP is more uh, taking a, an inbound transaction or an interaction, doing some analytics with it. So maybe the transaction starts or the interaction starts, but then there are a lot of calculations or reads doing things to figure out a better outcome for that transaction or interaction, right? So it's kind of in the middle of this transaction, you're doing some analytics in the middle. Is that a fair summary? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. I couldn't say better. So uh, before you said that transactions and analytics were separate um, and you said they, they went down different paths. Um, what did it mean and, and what is that what does that say about not being able to do HTAP with that existing architecture? What was wrong with doing analytics on the side? So uh, here is my my understanding is that uh, you need to ETL your data. And uh, actually it's like a standard de facto approach people do right now when they separate operational databases from uh, the analytical databases. But uh, a disadvantage here is that you are going to do to run your analytic analytical queries on a stale data. The data will be stale because it was probably etl two hours ago, 30 minutes ago, or two days ago. And you don't have kind of uh, an actual view on the current state of your system because the current state of your system is in your real operational database. And the goal of HTAP and probably RAP will at uh, some points on top of this is that HTAP applications and HTAP uh, storages, they can allow you to do analytics of the system in its current state with the actual data it has, with the most up-to-date data, which is uh, required for many banking systems and for e-commerce. For instance, now, if you try to open a loan in the bank, you might get, be, you, you can, you can can be approved in a matter of seconds, simply because many banking systems uh, do these calculations right away in real time or the operational data sets. Or they can do it quickly. But with the ETL, you're always uh, going to deal with bigger latencies and uh, uh, longer delays. So what's the typical acceptable delay in HTAP? Uh, here's... I, I, uh, actually, I think that it depends. For someone, uh, it's all about your SLAs, but usually uh, when it comes to uh, transactional uh, operation, uh, then here is, I think that we are looking at at least milliseconds, right, or microseconds uh, SLAs. When it comes to analytical operations, here is we can uh, talk up to, uh, up to one second or even more. It depends. Yeah, yeah, I know. If I'm on home away for is a good example. If I'm doing VRBO, I'm pretty much expecting a response time of a second, end to end, or any kind of personalization mm -hmm. or pricing, or if I get retargeted with different pricing, it's generally about a a second online. That's been my that's been my personal cutoff, and I think the studies that I've seen say mm -hmm. it's about a second, and, and other customers, I know uh, folks like ING have talked about, about a second. Um, how How is it possible then to do the calculations or the analytics with Cassandra if a write comes in or if a transaction starts, some interaction, and then do the analytics to respond in time to answer with that kind of response time? How would people get that done? I don't know, here is I'm more concerned. Cassandra, Cassandra can satisfy some of the queries, but here is I would be concerned by about what it gives for our transactional operations. Because as I said earlier and showed, when we talk about Cassandra, we would just talk about row level isolation. And in my experience, uh, when the comp those companies who uh, adopt HTAP approaches, they need more than row level isolation. So here is I would, even not try to give any or bring out any numbers on the performance 
of the SLAs because Cassandra can execute an operation pretty fast if you uh, created all the tables with uh, the redundant, redundant data you need for all the queries you have. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to transactions, here is it can fall short. Okay. Because okay. And one last question. I think we're running out of time, but another one was um, given that you're mixing the transactions and the analytics, what are some of the typical technologies that get used with something like Cassandra or Ignite to do HTAP, you know, to, to combine the transaction part and the analytics part? Or I'm machine sure learning, to, or for example. Yeah, to my mind, so what I have, for sure, we were talking about Ignite. Also, we, uh, it will be fair to add grid gain as an enterprise vendor of Ignite that provides enterprise solutions on top of Ignite. Then we can add SAP, SAP uh, products to the list, such as SAP HANA. And probably, Rob, you will be able to add anything to the list. Do you have yeah, I think the question, uh, the way the question was being asked was more, what other technologies outside of in-memory computing need to be integrated? And what, what other technologies like um, a Spark or some kind of analytic technologies need to be integrated with the, the database or the data grid to mm -hmm. implement HTAP, or what have people typically used? I see what you're saying. So you're actually yeah, talking about an ecosystem of different products and technologies needed for HTAP. Yeah. Uh, yeah here is absolutely, we see that a huge demand for uh, streaming products such as Kafka or Storm or Flink that are used to uh, set up real-time streams, pipelines mm -hmm. of data that is being uh, injected into your distributed storage. Mm -hmm. And next, also, we see a lot of uh, interest coming from the Spark users, from the Spark community. Uh, Spark is really is a, is a really excellent computational engine. And as for here is, I know that Cassandra is not integrated. I know it's. it's it's fair to say that you can use Kafka and different other streaming technologies together with Cassandra, but when it comes to Spark, uh, it might be a case that there is some Spark connector for Cassandra, but Ignite is uh, integrated with Spark in such a way that no other vendor uh, does. So Ignite can be used as in-memory storage for Spark, uh, and you can run your data frames or RDDs calculations from your Spark applications as you would run with uh, for Hadoop deployments. And all the calculations, or at least most of the calculations, like SQL queries, will take in place in Ignite. So you will you will avoid data movement from uh, Ignite to to Spark, and that's probably the biggest benefit you can gain for all Ignite and Spark calculation. And the same is for the machine learning. Uh, with the machine learning in Ignite, Cassandra doesn't give you any calculated processing techniques. Actually, yeah. it's surprising for me. It's surprising yeah, I, I for think, me. I think the challenge is, from what I've seen, is um, Spark needs something to manage its memory better. You know, that's where the big benefit comes with Spark. Uh, how you feed the memory in, you know, the data into memory, how you manage what you save over time. Mm -hmm. And Cassandra isn't about that. Cassandra is about uh, fast writes to disk and throughput. So it's not focused on serving Spark's needs. And I think that's where the any kind of integration would fall short. So, um, but it looks like we're out of time. So uh, Dennis, thank you for walking us through all of this. Um, if you have any other questions, you can always feel free to uh, join the uh, Apache Ignite community and ask your questions there. Uh, many folks like Dennis are there watching carefully. So feel free to join the community, but uh, that is it for today. So thank you so much for joining and I hope you join again soon. Thanks guys, thanks. Have a good day.